Hi. In this video, we're going to be talking about section 14.6, which is all about directional derivatives. Now, technically, this is just a generalization of the skill we talked about in 14.3. In 14.3, we talked about what would happen if I wanted to find the slope at some point on this blue surface here. Okay, if I wanted to find the slope at P, we talked about all the problems that would occur. For instance, what slope are we talking about? Are we talking about this slope? Are we talking about this slope? Or perhaps we're talking about something else because there's infinitely many tangent lines to that 3D surface at P. One technique we did was to take a plane parallel to the YZ plane and that would cut the surface through point P like this. And then we have a planar curve and we understand how to get this kind of a tangent line to a planar curve. We understand that that would be the slope in which direction? Well, we're keeping the X coordinate fixed. So we're taking the derivative with respect to Y. Right, that's the slope at P with respect to Y, keeping the X fixed. We also talked about cutting with a plane parallel to the XZ plane. Parallel to the XZ plane, the curve maybe looks something like that. And then we would have a tangent line like this. And that would be the tangent line F sub well, this time the Y is constant and the X is changing. So it's the slope with respect to X. Those are two kinds of directional derivatives. Those are the special directional derivatives. That's what we talked about in 14.3. Now we would like to give a more general process where we allow for both X and Y to change simultaneously, both. We're not going to be able to do this overly much. We'll only be able to change them both at the same time linearly, but we're going to change them along a certain direction. That's another way of thinking about how they change linearly. So we're going to choose a direction, choose a direction. And when we're choosing these directions, we're really talking about unit vectors. So this is um, a little bit of uh, chapter 12 coming back. A unit vector in the plane of the independent variables, of the independent variables, both of them. Now for this drawing, we're talking about the xy plane. We're talking about the xy plane. We're always going to call this vector u, u hat. And so u hat is some vector that's living here in the xy plane, pointing along both the x direction and the y direction. Again, we've talked about how to do this with two special unit vectors. Under this idea, under this idea, F sub X is the derivative in I hat direction and F sub Y is the derivative in the J hat direction. Right, that's what we've been talking about. But now we're choosing a different unit vector in a different direction along this point. So what will that look like? How do I get a planar curve like this? Well, I'm going to project P into our plane and find some new point 
let's say it's P1 or P prime, doesn't really matter. We can copy that unit vector and get a parallel vector along this section. and copy that up. And now we've had three points and we can define a plane that slices through our picture containing P, again, P prime or P one down there and my new unit vector, okay? This plane slices my surface in the same way the xy parallel plane or sorry the xz parallel plane and the yz parallel plane did to produce a curve a planar curve exactly the kind of thing we can talk about doing a derivative of and i'm just going to keep going until i get to another point q and we can talk about how this derivative works. Okay, let H be um, some distance in U hat direction away from P1. Okay, so we're going to go H away from P1. And get to Q1. We're going to project that back up. And now we have our secant line along that curve. The directional derivative is going to be a limit as we close that distance H, right? We wanna draw these two points together in order to get a tangent line. If you're having trouble remembering what we're talking about here, the secant line would be the three-dimensional line that connects P and Q. We wanna limit that distance in order to get the tangent line. We wanna to start to solve for the slope of the line PQ. Okay, now we're gonna find the slope along this plane. That's why it still makes sense. In previous sections, we may have said how a three-dimensional slope is kind of hard to talk about, but not if we limit it to a plane. If to a single plane, we're just talking about a rotated version of our normal calculus, so to speak. So if P is that coordinates X, Y, and then some function X of Y gives us the Z coordinate, how do we get to Q? And Q1 is H away from P1 in the U hat direction. And let's go one more step just to get, you know, even more letters on the board. And U hat is some vector with components A comma B. You could call it U1 and U2. I'm not trying to get too fancy. The book calls it A and B. So let's just stick with A and B. A and B are just the components of the unit vector. Then Q, its coordinates would be X plus H in the A direction, Y plus H in the B direction, and then F of all that nonsense. H A, Y plus H B. Okay. That's the hard part to understand, probably, if you're just looking at this, 
right? H is the distance from P to Q. A is how far to go in the X direction if we want to go along the direction U. B is the how far we want to go in the Y direction. So this is H A. Sorry, let's limit that. And this is HB. We're talking about this little triangle here of changes in X and changes in Y. If you didn't see what I just drew, I'm talking about right here. This change and this change is what HA would be. HA is the distance that we move along the X. HB is the distance we move along the Y. Obviously, this is not super important that you are able to recreate this argument. What I want you to see is that it's important we're putting H in all of these spots. That we're putting H in all of these spots. Because what we want to do one more time is to find the slope. So the slope of PQ is going to be the change in the Z height which is f of x plus h a y plus h b minus f of x minus y sorry f of x y the z coordinate of point p all divided by h now y is h in the bottom h is supposed to be the change in the distance between them in the coordinate system set up there, in the coordinate system set up by P and Q and P1 and Q1, H is the change in the uh, horizontal distance, let's say, right? H is the change that we were talking about minimizing even back in Calc 1 or Calc AB. And that's why this ends up being a well-defined notion of slope, where basically, instead of using this coordinate system or this coordinate system, the YZ plane or the XZ plane, we're using a tilted coordinate system in order to get this situation resolved into a coherent notion of slope and derivative. Now, if you're just in this for the shut up and calculate perspective, here we go. With all of that set up, then the directional derivative terminology at P X Y in the direction of U, all this setup has to be there. We need both. We need a point now and a direction is duff. Okay. It's going to be a scalar, but we have a little vector subscript. I guess we should be saying of F of F, the directional derivative of F always forget something which is going to be the limit as H approaches zero of that equation I just wrote. H A Y plus H B minus F of X Y all over H. That's the directional derivative. And again, if we're talking about a unit vector in the X direction only, in the I direction, then A is one and B is zero. If A is one and B is zero, then we're talking about exactly the same directional derivative we had for F, X, F sub X. These are all the same notion. Now, this would be a very hard limit to compute. If you remember 14.2, limits in 3D are very hard. So we're going to have a very useful theorem here. 
for f a function of x and y and u a unit vector equal a component u in the x direction and a component u in the y direction u2 in the y direction the directional derivative of f at any point x y is the x component of the derivative times u1 plus f y the y component of the derivative u2 that's it this is a big major important fact all you have to do is have a unit vector and the two partials and you can get whatever kind of directional derivative you want okay we were just trying to make sure we saw the theory here example find the derivative of f of x y equals x cubed minus 2x squared plus y cubed at p 1 comma 2 okay is this enough information to do something absolutely not you could find the x derivative that's what we would just say the partial derivative we could find the partial derivative with respect to x or the partial derivative with respect to y but we can't find the derivative so this is never going to be a well-formed question they will either say find all partial derivatives or they'll say find the derivative blah at a point in the direction of uh of we would do the vector um root two two root two two the 90 degree angle or sorry the 45 degree angle the pi over four angle in quadrant one okay that is a unit vector you can check we'll do an example in a moment where it's not going to be a unit vector they give you but this is a unit vector I guess I could say u hat equals. All right, so what do we need to do any derivative now? To do any specific derivative, we need a point, check. We need a unit vector, I'll write that out, unit vector, check. Um, what else do we need? We need a the partials need f sub x and f sub y so i got the first two things on the shopping list why don't you get the last one three two one pause the video i guess it's just in that pause the video and get these directional derivatives three two one the partial derivatives x three x squared minus four x the partial derivative at y is just 3y squared so now we can have the general partial sorry the general directional derivative in u of f at any point x comma y is going to be the x component times root 2 over 2 plus the y component times root 2 over 2 this works at any point x y they gave us a specific point blah. so at p one comma two my directional derivative along that direction u of f evaluated at one comma two is going to be negative root two over two plus six root two or 11 root 2 over 2. We're going to do another one. Find the derivative of f of x, y equals x to the fourth plus 2x, y 
plus y squared at p1 comma 2. So I'm changing the function. I'm keeping the point the same. We still need a direction. In the direction of the vector v, notice how it doesn't say u, 2 root 3 i hat plus 2 j hat. Notice immediately that they're calling it vector v. That's a hint to you that you should double check. Is that a unit vector? How do we check if it's a unit vector? The easiest way, because you have to do this anyway, is find the magnitude or the length of v. Here's a good chance to check if you still remember that from the way earlier videos. That's going to be the square root of, I'll just go over the whole thing, 2 root 3 squared plus 2 squared, which is the square root of 12 plus 4, or 4, 16. It's root 16 is 4. So not a unit vector. So we can make the unit vector. And remember, the unit vector is just like the pure direction. We're trying to wipe out this magnitude and get pure direction. So I'm going to take v and divide it by the length of v to get a unit vector, which is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal or root 3 over 2 in the i direction plus 1 half in the j direction. This is also an angle. This is the angle where the x component is bigger than the y component and that would be an angle of pi over six, okay? You should remember how to do stuff like that, ideally. So if we did all that, that's our unit vector, check one. We have a point. Right now, on your paper, you should work out what f sub x is and what f sub y is. Three, two, one. F sub x, 4x cubed plus 2y. F sub y, 2x plus 2y. Putting it all together, the direction of vector in this direction for this function at any point xy would be 4x cubed plus 2y times root 3 over 2 plus 2x plus 2y times 1 half. Now you could simplify that a bit. Again, I'm going to point out to you that this is not a vector. It's going to be very important for you to keep track of what's a vector and what's not a vector. This is not a vector. This is a scalar. We just haven't plugged in anything yet. So when I plug in my point, 1 comma 2, what do I get? I get 4 plus 4, 8 times root 3 over 2, plus 2 plus 4, 6 times 1 half, or I guess 4 root 3 plus 3. That's really it. So mostly theory in the beginning, but the work has stayed the same. In the next video, we'll investigate why the formula is this way and other uses of this fact, let's say. Thank you for watching. Thanks for your hard work, and I'll see you in the next video.